Welcome to Santa Barbara Talks with Josh Molina. I am here today with Elliot Jacobson, my favorite guest of all the shows that I have done because I learned so much and I want to talk so much, Elliot, about what's happening with this weather phenomenon, this weather event that we're having. You and I were in Santa Barbara. All of Central California is experiencing this huge weather event. And we heard the National Weather Service say this could be life threatening. Now, you and I were recording this on a Saturday afternoon, and um, it feels very rainy and wet and windy. It does not feel catastrophic. Let's talk about one. Let's talk about a couple of things. But first, Elliot, let's dive right in. Thank you for being on the show. I appreciate it. Let's dive right in. What's going on? What are you seeing with this weather event? Is it a letdown for you? Is it exactly what you expected? What are we seeing happening? So thanks for having me on again, Josh. It's a, it's a real pleasure. I always enjoy being on your show. Thanks so much. So yeah. what happened just a few days ago is we were expecting uh, two inches of rain and we got five and it was a massive storm and it came through with rainfall rates uh, in excess of an inch an hour, which is, is well into the uh, flood range and the, the sort of range that could create a problem locally. And then uh, we kind of missed that one, right? So I think people got a little bit freaked out. It's like, we cannot miss this one because on paper, uh, 48 hours out, this one looked to be a lot worse than the one we just had, which was pretty bad. And so all of these preparations were taken in anticipation of a worst case scenario. Um, but these systems are very dynamic. They're changing very quickly. And uh, I mean, this one that we're in the middle of now was predicted to be seven inches of rain two days ago, five inches of rain yesterday, down to two inches of rain this morning. And it, it might end up at one and a half inches of rain, or it might suddenly change. And we might get one of these bright red cells go right over our heads and, and have a, a critical situation happen in the, in the span of an hour. And we don't know that right now because we're in the middle of this. But I will say that as of right now, it is nothing, it is nowhere near to the sorts of predictions we were hearing uh, two days ago. Yeah, so um, Elliot, I should remind our, our viewers, I assume everyone knows everything since I've talked to you a couple of times. You're a uh, professor, retired professor of mathematics. You are a doctor. Uh, you also very much so study what is happening with the rising ocean temperatures. You study what's happening in terms of climate change. And you have developed this reputation on Twitter and among your followers for somebody who's an expert in this field. And I'm sort of lucky to have you on my show because you've been on CNN and you've talked nationally and you get all these invitations to talk about your views in the context of, of climate change. We the, the National Weather Service did so much to prepare people for the worst case scenario here. I think they're saying maybe overnight, you know, at least they were saying it could get kind of kind of worse thunder, lightning, winds. We've seen lots of trees uh, fall over. Why is this happening? I mean, I grew up in Santa Barbara, Galita. We know it's, you know, it doesn't rain a whole lot, but it does rain in January, February, March. What's happening right now that's different, that's unique? Well, first of all, we are in the uh, midst of an El Nino, and that is a periodic change in sea surface, equatorial sea surface temperatures, off of the western uh, coast of, of Central America. And this particular El Nino um, is now officially a strong or major El Nino. So they look at the difference in the sea surface temperatures in that region of the ocean um, to see sort of uh, how much impact this will have on our weather. And the last one of these we had was in 2016. And the, the one before that, that was as strong as this one was 1997. And each time we have an event that sort of ranks up at this level of severity, we get kind of a, a quantum leap in terms of the weather phenomena that are happening to us, right? So, so we might go along at one sort of set of temperatures as averages, and then we have an El Nino and it bumps up. And it never quite settled down to the to the level the previous one was at. And then we have another one and it bumps up and it never quite settled down. So we are at the start of kind of a new climate paradigm right now globally and certainly in Santa Barbara. 
Now, this particular uh, storm has been predicted for a while because there have been these um, straight line um, winds coming across the Pacific, just aiming right for us. And it was just a question of when they were going to hit us and whether they were going to kind of split apart at the last minute or just hit us directly. And so these winds are close to uh, 150 miles an hour, kind of at the jet stream level. Mm -hmm. And so the question was just, just how much would that actually drive towards us? And uh, so the, the worst part of the winds is actually hitting up towards San Luis Obispo, where they're getting 60 to 80 mile an hour wind gusts. I think you know, we've maybe had a 30 or 40 mile an hour, you know, together with how saturated the ground is, is certainly going to topple a few trees, which is what we've experienced. Um, but the uh, storm itself is kind of a natural phenomenon. We get these, they call them uh, the Pineapple Express or the Atmospheric River. It's kind of a natural thing to have happen. Um, but two weeks ago, this was looking so severe that they were actually predicting that we might have this thing called an arc storm. And I don't know if you've heard of these things before or not. Um, they were calling this arc storm 2.0. <laughs> and essentially what that is, is a, a series of storms that are with these straight line winds that just come in unabated into California and can dump feet, not inches, but feet of rain over a period of a couple of weeks straight, just nonstop. And they happen every sort of uh, 150 to 200 years is kind of the, the typical timeline for these things. And so when we were two weeks out, there was talk about this being, being a possible arc storm scenario. And uh, that fizzled out pretty quickly. Um, but the in the media, the hype was still there that this might be an arc storm. But, uh, you know, anybody who was really watching this closely could tell that it was not going to be that strong. Um, so, you know, that is the ordinary climate science behind this. Um, but, I mean, what has actually changed, though, what has really changed that is sort of driving new weather uh, systems globally in the northern hemisphere is how hot the Arctic is right now. Um, it is just mind blowing how how warm this you know it, it is in many places thirty degrees forty degrees above average right now in the Arctic Circle right and what happens when you have all that hot air up there is that the gradient of temperatures between sort of the equator and the Arctic um, uh, is it's not as big a gradient and what that does is it allows all that Arctic air to kind of die down and so we have. We have kind of this super wavy pattern, right, where we get these super cold areas of the northern hemisphere that are just like record cold. And right next to that, a super heat wave that's record hot. And so, you know, that's the story in a lot of the northern hemisphere right now. Is And it's been that way as areas experiencing these extreme temperature anomalies, both hot and cold. So, you know, that's kind of the, the big overview of what's going on right now is this these, this unstable polar jet stream together with the, the El Nino uh, at the same time. So you're kind of feeling that it's kind of a relief that we're not seeing what we thought we were going to see two weeks ago, what you called it, an, an arc? Yeah, like, A-R-K, like, like, like Noah's, Noah's Ark. Ark. Like, yeah, like an arc storm. Is yes. What they call it. Yes, exactly. So I mean, it's gather all your animals together and put them in a boat. We're going to sail out of the Central Valley. I mean, really, it's like that. That That is how bad it would be. It, it is a multi-trillion dollar scenario in terms of the damages. Mm -hmm. And it could happen any year, honestly. It, it is a little bit overdue. And so there was, I mean, there was actually serious concern for this two weeks out. So... We're in a good position right now, you're saying, unless you're in San Luis Obispo, where it's a little bit windy here on the central coast. We're looking out, though, they're saying another, you know, end of Monday kind of thing. Do I hear you saying that sort of maybe the worst is is over? It's not looking as though it's going to be as doomsday as some had thought. Well, yeah, it was supposed to um, be brutal early this morning and then that kind of came and went and then late morning and that came and went. And, uh, you know, a friend uh, texted me an emoji of somebody yawning. Um, <laughs> so, so instead of an arc storm, it's a yawn storm. I yeah. mean, we've had things like this quite often. It's really, you know, nothing extraordinary at all, but, you know, I can um, just, if I, if I, you look at the weather, you know, you can just see that there's nothing really 
powerful that's incoming right now. There's not like at this moment, there isn't um, a band of rain that, that you know, they're expecting is going to um, come ashore in the next hour or two and, and make up um, for this not being as bad as people thought. So, yeah, you know, this is kind of an anti-climax, but I mean, it's a really good lesson for us. I mean, they canceled school tomorrow, right? You right. heard them can't. And, you know, this is, yeah, sure, on the East Coast, you cancel uh, if, if there's uh, a snowstorm, right, and the buses aren't safe to drive. But honestly, there's going to, there's no problem driving tomorrow. You know, right. it's just a little bit of rain for the rest of the country. So it really shows how um, sort of on edge our local emergency, uh, you know, companies are, given the history of what's happened in Santa Barbara. You know, they're, everybody's on edge. They, they do not want to make the mistake in the other direction where they put people out on the road into the middle of the floods. Well, yes, there's definitely, you know, one nine from five years ago. That is something that they never want to be, they never want to see again. So now there's always over preparation uh, so that if anything horrible were to happen like that, they can say they did everything they could this time. So that's definitely true. Elliot, We've talked about climate change. We've talked about your Doomer perspective on things, and you get a lot of attention nationally because of that. When we feel, when we see this kind of rain, right, it doesn't feel like to a lay person, okay, and most of my viewers are going to be lay people who, you know, understand these things on a general level. Talk to me about how the rising temperatures are affecting all of this because many people will say it's cyclical. You know, you talked a hundred years ago, we get these arc storms, 150 years, and it is what it is. You, the whole point of what you've been talking about and getting so much attention about is no, this is, this is the worst that it's ever been. And there's no going back. There's no fixing it really. So talk about how the situation right now, so people don't feel, too comfortable like oh well it's not as bad as we thought so we are really lucky to live in santa barbara <laughs> i mean we're sort of isolated because we're right next to a, a cool ocean and so we don't it's rare for us to get the sorts of extremes that that are happening on the rest of the planet right so we're just not aware um in this particular place and i think that's true in a lot of parts uh, of the united states with which has had a relatively cool spell this year compared to other parts of the planet. I mean, Europe right now is boiling hot, right? They're having records, especially in Southern Europe, in, in Greece, for example. And one of the reasons is that that essentially the uh, North African desert climate is, is reaching into Southern Europe. It's crossing the Mediterranean. So what is true is that in the last 365 days, if you look at the actual daily global temperatures, we have crossed the 1.5 C threshold, that Paris limit threshold that's supposed to be, we will never cross this. Well, we have crossed that, right? We have crossed that, that threshold. So we are now in that place globally that, that we've said we never want to get to. We Right now, as of today, global sea surface temperatures, right? You you average sea surface, the whole planet, right? At, are at highs, they are at record highs. They are at highs that we have never seen before as long as we've been taking measurements, right? Which dates back to last century with when they would actually scoop water with buckets out of the ocean and, you know, measure the temperature just to, to try and get a better understanding of currents and climate and so on. Um, and in fact, some climate scientists have said that we are now on a planet that is hotter than it's been in over 100,000 years. So if you look at the paleo uh, climatological data, the data they get from um, ice cores and sea sediment samples and tree rings and other things like that, we are actually hotter now on the planet than we've been in over 100,000 years. And the way this plays out is not that the whole planet has a heat wave, right? or that the whole planet is uniformly warmed up by 1.5 C. The way this plays out is that everything is worse, right? The heat waves are hotter, right? The rainstorms are rainier, the snow, snow events are, there's more snow. And so the truth is for every one degree Celsius, the planet warms up, the atmosphere can hold 7% more moisture. So if we are one and a half percent higher in temperature, 
That means our atmosphere is holding more than 10% more moisture than it did 100 years ago, right? And what's happening with all that moisture? Well, it's coming down in rain and snow. And what does that look like? It looks like floods, right? Maybe we're not getting the flood here, but they're getting, you, you go online, you can just, just Google floods. You'll see it. This is happening now. You know, over and over, parts of the planet are getting floods like they've never gotten before, right? Or you'll see record snowfall, right? Meanwhile, you see other places like parts of Europe that, that have less snow than they've ever had in their history, right? They, they, there's no snow there at all, and it's baking hot. So climate change means climate change. Only in this case, it means in the context of storms that are more frequent, stronger, and of longer duration, right? More frequent, stronger, and of longer duration. It doesn't mean storms stop happening or, or that every place gets hotter. It just means everything gets more intense, mm -hmm. right? And the, it gets more intense while gradually getting hotter kind of not in a non-uniform way. So I hope that kind of gives you an overview for what the current state of the planet is. Um, it is uh, kind of an extraordinary place from when we spoke last summer, right? All the things we kind of predicted would happen have happened and then some, right? It's been, uh, the, the acceleration has actually been, been much faster than anybody anticipated and, you know, completely caught the climate scientists off guard. I mean, they were, they were flat-footed and you see the articles that came out this year, you know, summarizing. It's been just just a a wild year to live through, and twenty twenty four promises to be even more that. We talked, Elliot, about the attitude of being a doomer. Everywhere I go, Elliot, there are still people who say, "Ride your bike, use an electric car, or you know, buy an electric car." recycle, uh, be environmentally friendly, be environmental steward. Um, it's taught in schools. Um, it's part of our culture here in Santa Barbara that we can make a difference. And we feel so good that we can be part of turning this around. And then, of course, you have celebrities who sort of talk about the importance of, of climate change and doing everything we can. And we're all part of the solution. You, on the other hand, and so let me, let me go to you. So my question is, everybody's trying to be more environmentally friendly, yet we are still seeing the hottest planet that we've seen. And so why is this happening? If we're more environmentally friendly as people than we've ever been, but yet it's getting worse. How does this happen? So there is a lot to what you just asked, and, and I'm not sure how much of it I can cover before I kind of lose track of what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, but I mean, first of all, um, we are 2023 saw record greenhouse gas emissions. So regardless of uh, electric vehicle, right, we still have more coal plants in China than we've ever had before. You know, we have um, a larger population in India. We have... Um, you know, methane that's coming out not only from the human sources, but from the wetlands and, and the, the equi uh, equatorial wetlands, right? So we have this sort of constant build of greenhouse gases that's gone unabated. And as those gases go up, the planet heats up. That's a fact. In fact, I just did this computation this morning, right? It's, so it's, it's right on par with the question you asked. If we were to completely stop everything we do right now, right? Let's just say everybody just decided for the rest of their life, they're going to sit in their chair and, and do Please. nothing at all that, that makes the climate worse, right? The planet would still go up over 2C. And according to some climate scientists, it would go, go up over 3C. And I include in those climate scientists, James Hansen, the person who testified before Congress in the 1980s, right? So climate scientists are not quite in agreement with this, but we are looking right now at implied warming of at least two degrees uh, Celsius, which is 3.6 Fahrenheit over the, the baseline, the 1850 baseline, right? So we have a lot more warming built into the system, no matter what we do. And that warming is going to hit us. And it's going to, you know, so everything ahead of us, um, it sort of doesn't matter what we do, we will see that warming. Now, will we see even more warming on top of that, right? And that's what some of these things that you're talking about are sort of geared towards. 
But the truth is that that as long as the greenhouse gases keep going up, we are not slowing this thing down at all. This train is just going faster and faster toward, towards uh, climate, the impacts, the worst impacts of climate change. Now, on the other topic, right, which is really important to me personally as a doomer, um, it's my opinion, and I'm going to speak purely from opinion here, that um, environmentalism has lost its way, completely and totally lost its way. Because when I was a child, right, speaking of, of somebody who um, knew about Santa Barbara being the birthplace of the environmental movement in the early 70s, who went to Earth Day in 1977 at UC Davis, right? I, I known about this stuff for a long time in my life. When I was a child, here's what happened. The um, Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, getting rid of lead from gasoline and paint, stopping DDT, right? The Endangered Species Act. Right. On and on. All of these things we did, these governmental, these policy initiatives that actually made a difference in the environment and prolonged the environment and kept the environment uh, at least stable enough to last so that we could be here today having this conversation instead of already being on a planet that was inhospitable. Right. Now, what is environmentalism? Is it caring about nature? Is it caring about the planet? No. What environmentalism has become is how can we maintain a habitable planet for humans for as long as possible? How can we keep this planet so that human civilization can keep going, can persist? Well, if we all drive EVs and, and become vegans and you know there's more solar and wind and all this, then maybe civilization can keep going for another 50 or 100 years. But that's at the expense of the natural world, right? Every time we build a solar panel, there's not only the mining that went into that, the lithium and other minerals, um, there's also the location it's placed. And, and these industrial scale solar farms are being placed, you know, on, on pristine desert ecosystem. These wind turbines are being placed in pristine um, hillsides. So we are actively destroying the environment to preserve uh, global industrial civilization. And that's that's what environmentalism has transformed into from its roots as how can we save nature to its current day, how can we save global industrial civilization? Okay. So, you know, that's, when you ask that question, it's a very deep question and it goes a lot of directions. So, so a um, couple of things there. Is it more important? So for example, I, I will admit, I drive my van to pick up my daughter from school every day, right? I, I'm sure there are people who say, Josh, why don't you ride a bike? Why don't you walk? Why don't you figure out a different way? What I'm hearing you say is these corporations, the government, this is where the change needs to happen uh, because individuals doing these things is great, right? It's not like a bad thing if you walk. But as far as the, the change that we're trying to make, it's exponentially much bigger than any one individual. And I feel like the environmental movement tends to say, look, you drive a gas-powered car, you're bad. And look, I drive an electric vehicle, I'm good. When that's that's really not where the environmental debate should be, right? right. Am I understanding that? Yeah, and I completely agree with you. I mean, if you want to know what the environmental debate should be, it should be, should we do away with all cars um, and all transport? Should we prohibit transport by a car unless it's an emergency or mandated travel, for example, delivery of food, um, and uh, install public public transportation, you know, get just develop um, massive public transportation infrastructure? So that would be the kind of debate. Now, the problem is we have two political parties, and I will tell you I agree with one more than the other, primarily because of social issues. Yeah. But, but one of them is still invested in coal and fossil fuels. The other one is invested in green technology. But they're both invested in technologies that are destructive to the planet. And they're both, you know, maybe you could argue one is more or less destructive than the other, but, but both of them are... Um, industries that are driven by profit, right? They're they're 
they have lobbying going on. They they want to sell their products. You know, they want to get the contracts. So you know, the the question is not uh, Democrat or Republican as far as who will get a, a piece of polit- policy enacted. The question is: Is there any um, facility whatsoever for massive change on a global scale that's really needed to do even the smallest, you know, meaningful thing to stave off collapse? And and you know, prohibiting travel would be the first step. Now, no individual, me or you or anybody else, is going to willingly say, "Oh no, I'm never going to go visit my relatives who live 50 miles away again." But you know, um, 300 years ago. There were a lot of people who never traveled more than 20 miles from their house their whole life, right? There were a lot of, I mean, travel is just not part of your life. You Wherever you lived, that's where you lived. And, you know, it was a pain to get on a horse or a carriage or whatever and go 20 miles. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, if if we really want to talk about what it takes on a global scale, the small, um, um, you know, delta, the difference between your fossil fuel and an equivalent electric vehicle is, is irrelevant. Plus, Electric vehicles also suffer this horrible uh, condition that they burn through tires, right? The the average tire that, that you or I drive on a fossil fuel vehicle might last 30 to 50,000 miles on an electric vehicle because they're so much heavier. These batteries are really heavy. Uh, these tires are only lasting eight to 10,000 miles. And so what we're doing is we're getting a huge quantity of the these microplastics. I mean, the, the largest generation of microplastics on the planet right now is from uh, the erosion of car tires, hmm. right? Every time you drive your car, you're, you're making clouds of the, these plastics that are floating up into the air uh, and landing in, in everything now uh, all over the planet. So, you know, there's there's nothing good um, about any personal vehicle that's driven by electric or hydrogen or or fossil fuel. I mean, the only solution is is massive public transportation. And there are some European countries that have that. There's some cities in, in the United States that have that. But uh, where we live, no. I mean, And I'll tell you, I, I ride the bus and walk, right? I, I As much as I can. I, I do my best to do that. And I drive, you know, yeah. because that sometimes is necessary. Uh, but, you know, I think it's a good question, you know, and it, it, it's such an important question to understand the scale of what's actually needed compared to the scale an individual could ever do. Yeah. You know, when I hear you talk, I sort of feel like a, I'm in elementary school and and like we only heard about Columbus Day. Right. It wasn't until we got older and, you know, into college or, you know, high school, maybe. And you started to f- understand, oh, well. This wasn't, you know, Thanksgiving wasn't like this celebration between Columbus and the Native Americans. It was something entirely different. And when I hear you talking, I feel like you're kind of what we're going to be talking about or what people will be talking about years from now when we talk about the environmental movement and when we talk about climate change, that you're so far ahead that we should be talking about these things now. But instead, we're still living in this green bubble. Right. And and the, the bias toward the electric car, uh, toward uh, demonizing individuals for their choices when it's so much bigger than us. And so I know I feel that way that you're sort of like you're the history that that you, you are what people are going to be teaching as the norm in the future. And I don't know how long yeah. that's going to be. But yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's going to have to have that kind of paradigm shift. Right. So so what you're talking about, you know, you probably know this term is called virtue signaling. Yeah. And a lot of people drive drive their electric vehicles or, you know, have their their metal cups or whatever uh, as part of their virtue signaling. And, you know, there was there was a study some years ago that asked about, OK, we have a plastic bag in a grocery store and that is a, a fossil fuel byproduct. And there's some uh, construction of it in transportation and it lasts for, you know, thousands of years in the dump or whatever. And that compared to, say, a cloth bag that you would purchase and reuse. Right. And there was some number like you would have to use that cloth bag uh, several hundred times before it had less of an ecological footprint than than a pla- you know using a plastic bag every time you went shopping. 
Um, the point being that you had to grow the crops to create it. You had to, you know, harvest the crops. You had to transport the crops to the, the factory that creates fabric. You create the fabric. You have to transport that to the place that creates the bag. You, you know, you have the people working to do that and, and um, their lifestyles involved while they're, you know, they're having their breaks, they're eating, they're driving there, right? And I mean, if you actually put it all together, a plastic bag has less of an ecological footprint than almost everybody on the planet who uses, you know, a, a hemp um, shopping bag. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of these paradoxes out there that people just aren't aware of uh, in terms of their choices, yet there's this social pressure to make green choices, right? Um, and over and over again, they're not the right choice. And I, I completely feel that way about things like electric vehicles, but I also feel that way about solar power. And I feel that way about wind power as well. Um, the, the choice is not solar and wind, you know, renewables, um, uh, hydro and geothermal and, and uh, you know, wood pellets on one hand and fossil fuels on the other. That's not the choice because both of those are bad choices, right? The correct choice is less fossil fuels. No, none of this other technology, no green technology and less fossil fuels. Right. And how do we burn less fossil fuels, right? We um, buy less of everything. We use less of everything. We have fewer clothes. We drive less, right? We take public transportation. We walk more. So what, what it's really about in terms of saving the planet is not choosing green technology. It's about understanding that that we need to shrink everything down in our world. You know, we need to shrink our lives. We need to shrink our, our consumption. We need to shrink who we are and what we want to do. And there's almost zero chance that's going to happen. You're not going to tell, you know, Joe, uh, um, uh, pickup truck driver, you know, hey, you can't drive your truck anymore. And if you go on YouTube, what you'll see is there's there's some of these guys are like, Oh, oh, the people don't want me to drive my big old truck. Well, watch me. I'm just going to go burn some fossil fuels just so I can, you know, give give all those environmentalists the middle finger. Right. And I mean, there's actually kind of an anti movement. And I just read this morning that in this country. Um, there's actually. Um, what was the number? 15 percent of counties nationwide. Are in some. Uh, are banning some green technology, solar or wind, or saying you cannot put uh, industrial power grids of that type in our counties. We don't want them. Yeah. And there's actually a faster movement to ban these green technologies than there is to build them, right? So it's there's already this revolt against it. And what we saw happen in the upper Midwest with uh, electric vehicles when it got too cold and all these vehicles were stuck in the charger stations, you know, in, in Chicago, there's gonna be a huge backlash against the electric vehicle industry as well for this. So the truth is we're stuck with fossil fuels. We've got to get that into our heads and we've got to, you know, drop our use of them through our own, uh, through actual government mandate and policy, people are not going to make that choice. And none of that's going to happen, Josh. And that's why I'm a doomer. Yes. And less is more, but I mean, we don't even talk about the whole population conversation because it's, you know, it's very controversial yeah, not, to talk I'm not about have that. that conversation. I'll just change the subject. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, because when we're talking about less is more, that means less and, and right. everything in all ways. Elliot, one thing I have never asked you is you obviously were not just sort of spontaneously created with this doomer attitude. You know, you just kind of woke up with it. Um, you This must have developed over the years. And at some point in your life, I would imagine you were one of these green technology, environmental type of people. And then you said, wait a minute or or not. But can you just tell me, how did you get to be Elliot, the doomer, it's not an approach most people have when they're yeah. just sort of growing up, living their lives. So, you know, I I was um, very much an environmentalist uh, as a teenager, right? I, I went to a number of these sorts of, of um, gatherings. There used to be sort of music and Frisbees and, you know, it was a, um, a whole sort of hippie thing in the 70s uh, uh, to do the to go to these um, events. And 
so, you know, I sort of grew up around all of these successes and um, they were very inspiring, right? I mean, to at the time, um, you were really feeling like, like you were going to make a difference. You were going to change the world, right? And we did. I mean, I mean, my generation made some changes that were very profound and saved the planet. Um, you know, if we hadn't taken lead out of gasoline, uh, that was a huge, huge issue. It was, it was creating tremendous damage to, to ecosystems. So, uh, and on and on with the, the various um, regulations that were made. Um, and then Ronald Reagan came around, right? <laughs> and when he came around, I just remember feeling like, okay, it's all over. You know, everything that, that I thought was going to happen is not going to happen. None of it's going to happen. And that turned out to be correct, right? He would not even acknowledge there was such a thing as acid rain, uh, let alone do anything about it, um, you know, which is created by excess sulfates and sulfates were in fossil fuels. And so when you burn the fossil fuels, you create the sulfur that goes up and then it precipitates down to sulfuric acid. And, and that was um, what was the problem was. So we had to clean the fuels just like we took lead out of them to cure, cure that problem. And that means going against the fossil fuel industry. So, you know, during the Reagan years, there was also these issues of nuclear war that that were very terrifying. He he always felt like he was he was dumb enough that he could actually do something like that. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I sort of started thinking, OK, it's it's done. Right. It's all this sort of great um, idealism of my youth is gone. It's it's done. Um I was a bit of a prepper in the 1980s. Um, by prepper, I mean preparing for doomsday. You know, we would store water and, and other things with the assumption that that uh, society was going to collapse for some reason and we would need these supplies. Um, so, I mean, all of that is in my history, um, the sort of, but that was really the moment in my life that things changed um, for me was, was when Ronald Reagan was elected um, president, If you know, to be quite honest with you about that. Um, that was 1980, oh. and I would have been 22 at the time. So I was just coming out of this period of my life that was very idealistic and then just got hit in the face with this. Um, and, you know, this sort of continued through the Reagan years. Um, as far as the modern version of me, um, you know, I started sort of researching uh, the climate in detail as soon as I retired to sort of put some teeth to these feelings I had had all these years. So that would have been about 2016 when I re really started to, to look at environmental issues again after all these years in a more serious way. Yeah, and, and you definitely carved out a reputation in the mainstream. I, you know, it, Elia, I would love for you to get an award by, you know, one of these groups that talk about you know, you know, great we are environmentally. It's probably not going to happen because you say the opposite of what they say. But you are respected in the media as somebody who can give the story straight without any spin, without any sort of um, effort behind them to push an agenda. And so can you talk a little bit about, I mean, you've been on CNN International uh, you've done national shows uh, in this past year. Can you talk about how you fulfill that role in sort of going on and talking about being a doomer and what this means in this situation with climate change? Uh, talk to us a little bit about you making that circuit, so to speak, and you know how that makes you feel to be that guy. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, it's been pretty incredible. And, uh, you know, when I came on your show last June, I think I had just in the mid 20,000 uh, uh, Twitter followers. Now I'm I'm sixty, uh, going close to sixty nine thousand right now. Right. So it's been a huge gain in sort of my uh, reputation and being known by by people. And so I get more and more uh, media contacts. I'm going to be um, doing a um, a spot on a documentary that's being filmed in Australia. I was just uh, you know did something yesterday with somebody in Greece, and I did something with with somebody in Turkey, and you know. So yeah, I've been really kind of working with people internationally talking about these things. And I think the truth is that there are far more doomers out there um, than you know we want to sort of acknowledge because it is such a difficult position to sort of publicly state, to say, this is who I am and this is what I believe. And 
um, you get a lot of feedback. You know, your family doesn't want to talk to you. Your friends are alienated. Your kids are like, like, you know, how could you say that? You know, uh, look what you've done to the planet. And they're blaming you and stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, so so there's so many reasons to not be public about that. And so I, I think what I do is I get space for people to um, have those emotions and those experiences. And it's not just for climate we're talking about, right? There's a whole scope of other problems that are going on right now on the planet besides the climate, like the, the biosphere, you know, the, the extinction of species is happening, um, what's happening to the ice at the poles, you know, with with, with uh, the melting of, of the glaciers, you know, there's, there's just, um, you know, the overall uh, condition of the atmosphere on and on with, with problems that are happening. And so, um, you know, you can go larger than just climate and people are, are so open to hearing that. They really want to hear it and they want to know that that what they're feeling has some validity, that that it's okay to have this experience. It's okay to feel these things. There are other people out there who have these same feelings, right? And, and there's a name for that. And, uh, you know, I can be that way. Um, and it also it helps people articulate their positions, right? It helps people understand how they can speak about this um, to their friends when or their family when they have these conversations. Because this is an incredibly difficult thing to say, right? It is really hard to say that we are um, our generation, our time alive on this planet is the time when civilization is going to collapse, when when the the environment is going to collapse beyond its capacity to hold human civilization um, for the long term. Um, You know, that could have happened at any time. It just happens we are the humans alive when that's happening now. So, um, yeah, I I am really happy to do these uh, shows now. And, and, you know, your show, the first one I did, still holds the record, as far as I know, for the most views I ever got on one of these, which just tells you the hunger that was out there for it, right? So now when my shows, I'm averaging, you know, 2,000, 3,000, something like that in that kind of range, um, typically. Um, But, you know, I went on CNN, and I got to say something that I never expected I would say ever. You know, uh, I was talking about sea level rise and ocean heating and land heating and this and that. And the host said, well, Elliot, put a, put this all together for us. What does that really mean? What does that say for the planet? And I said, and, and this is CNN International. It's playing, you know, around the clock in airports all over the world. And I said, um, we are witnessing the collapse of global industrial civilization. We are witnessing the sixth great extinction. Right. And I got to say those words on CNN International. Right. right. <laughs> never, never expected in my wildest dreams I could say those words, you know. Yeah. Um, and so, so it's been kind of a ride. I just have to tell you the follow up. So, the host, the same host that had me on the first time, had yeah. me back on actually on Christmas Day. And in the pre interview <laughs> for the show, he said, Elliot, I want you to be able to say something hopeful today. Right. <laughs> so, so, you know, he's showing me all these reasons to be hopeful. And and we get to the end, you know, Elliot, do you have anything hopeful to say? And it's like, well, none of the things you just said are actually going to work. <laughs> so <laughs> that was, and he said, well, that wasn't really hopeful. <laughs> so, 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 yeah, it's been a wild ride. But I will you be back is the question on that show. You know, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm two for two now. Um but I, I mean, I'm so grateful that you're having me on again. Um, I don't have I have a feeling that, you know, this this message is, is getting out in a bigger way and I'm not the only one vocalizing it anymore. You know, you you start hearing uh, climate scientists more and more feeling like they have the space to say these things, you know, and actually hinting that they're frightened or they're seeing these scenarios play out. Um, and you have, you know, major media um, outlets like CNN um, and others more willing to to bring up these topics. So, you know, I think I, I've had an impact that's opened the conversation up and given uh, space for people to to say and say their experiences. So I'm grateful for that, and, and I, I have you to thank, honestly, uh, in a big way because you you're the first one to give me a platform that really took off like that. Yeah, well, thank you. I have you to thank too because this the most watched uh, podcast has been top two have been you. Um, you know, what I have figured out, though, Elliot, is these environmentalists, the ones who talk to me, they agree with you, but they will not say it. 
publicly, but privately they'll say, Josh, I'm not going to come on your show and dispute what Dr. Jacobson said. I'm not going to do that. We need to be positive. And then they just flip and they just sort of say, so it's almost as though they, they, at least what I've been told, you know, is, yeah, it makes sense, but we can't say that. <laughs> There's so much money that's made off of careers, political careers, um, grants and organizations and foundations on the hope, right? On the hope. And, and, and that's, so I've never had anyone disagree with you at all privately. They won't say anything about you. They'll just say, my focus is on this, you know, and I'm glad you mentioned the whole, um, the doomer thing and, and being able to say that because I know when, when I heard doomer, you know, two years ago, I sort of feel like it's somebody who's locked up in their basement, right? Like, and, and, and they're waiting for the, the big nuclear war. They're, they're in their bunker and they're going to be the ones who survive and no one else is. And that's like my ignorance. But yeah, other yeah. people feel that way too. Like when they hear that term, they think doomer when it's actually really just realist, right? Yeah, I, and, and that is actually the terminology. When people say, hey, I can't call myself a doomer, what else can I call myself? I mean, the, the second answer is climate realist, right? <laughs> you are a climate realist. Um, and, you know, that that's easier for people to digest. Um, and, I mean, there's a certain part of me who wants to use that terminology as well, except it's just not climate. It's so many more things. But most people just understand climate change as the as the singular issue out there. And, you know, when you talk about organizations and, and funding, I just want to say there is a lot of funding that takes place um, based on the messaging, the hopeful messaging that organizations put out. You know, even in our community, a lot of these sort of um, environmental organizations, right, are very committed to fundraising off of our local and we have a wealthy group of donors here, right? Yeah. Based on look at the progress we've made. We have done this, 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 and this, right? Rather than saying, look at the state of the planet now and how it's it's um, falling apart. Right. You know, that would never be the message. <laughs> no, it wouldn't. Hey, I was watching this documentary and I'm going to wrap up in a second. I know you're very busy and I appreciate your time here on a Sunday. Um, Truth Tellers. And it, it was about, it was on PBS and he was an artist and he was painting portraits of people who he believed were making change in the world from uh, a diversity, from a, a environmental climate change. So he was talking to African-Americans, he's talking to Native Americans, he's talking to climate science, uh, scientists, climate activists. And Greta Thunberg, Thunberg was on, you know, one of those things was featured in that. What would you say to her, Elliot, or a young person? Because we know when you're young and you referenced it. You feel like all those generations before you ruined it for you and you have no hope. And now you're left to fix the mess of the previous generation. What would you say to a young person who's hopeful, hopium, I think you call it. What would you say to them as not to like kill their spirit, but also be real with them? So uh... I think it's an excellent question and, you know, it really depends on the person that I'm speaking to because there's so many shades of this. So a lot of these organizations, for example, Extinction Rebellion or or, or um, Just Stop Oil, they have a specific agenda. They want to get X, Y, and Z accomplished under the belief that that will lead to a specific result that they want. You know, let's let's get solar, wind, uh, let's, get, let's close down fossil fuels and so on, do a green transition, and then X, Y, and Z will happen. Um, so, you know, if, if you have a person like that, it's very different than if you have a person like like Greta, who is just in the streets, you know, pouring her heart out every day as an activist. And so um, in general, you know, I say to them the same thing I say to everybody. It's like like be an environmentalist. Right. First and foremost, what's important is not global industrial civilization. What's important is the environment. Right. Focus on the environment. And it's not a question of green versus fossil fuel. It's a question of saving habitats. And so there, there actually are young people who are invested in that. And there is a book out there called Bright Green Lies. One of the authors, Derek Jensen, another is Max Wilber. I think there's a third one um, that really talks about this idea of, of 
um, how the environmental movement has lost its way by now being focused on, on technology that's going to preserve a lifestyle and a, a way of living rather than preserving the natural world. So, you know, my, my guidance is what's really important to you? What's really important to you? Is this civilization important to you or is the natural world important to you? You know, and find what's important to you and do everything you can for that. And I mean, that's always been my advice. It, it, my advice is be an activist, right? And, and for me, activism is this messaging that what's important is the natural world, not, the, not human civilization. Um, and so people will find, you know, the, the thing, but it gets them to think deeper than, than I'm just against something, right? What is the specific thing you are trying to save? What What is the thing? Are you trying to save a natural setting? Are you trying to um, save um, the ability to go to McDonald's and, and you know, get a Big Mac? Those are very different things, yeah. <laughs> you know, and you'll actually find there are people who are invested in saving the Big Mac, you know, yeah. more than, than they are the Andean condor, right? So yeah. uh, it's a wor weird world we live in right now, but um, it's a very delicate question. And, you know, this idea of blaming our generation, well, my generation more than yours, right? They really blame my generation because we had the opportunity for nuclear power and we just gave it up, Right. We didn't do nuclear when we had a chance and we're stupid for not doing it. Well, what would that have done? It would have allowed population to grow even more and even more energy and so on. And more, as a consequence, more destruction of the environment. Um, uh, so, you know, this this idea that, that they want to blame us, I get that. That's part of this bargaining uh, aspect of grief. And so I'll also try and talk to them about just, you know, the the things that they might not understand about how societies evolved over the centuries, the history of humans that kind of um, disputes their paradigm of, of blaming us, um, you know, just to, to get them past that, that sort of roadblock in their own activism, that, that it's not our fault, right? It's not our fault. We didn't do anything. Um, we just, we just did the same thing you're doing, right? <laughs> right. We just, we, we did our best. Our activists of our day did our best, yeah. right? Yeah, it's well said. And it is kind of so tough to think about any kind of real change. I mean, because when you, we don't think in our culture about the natural world, we think about people. You know, we think about elementary schools and, you know, you pledge allegiance to a flag, you know of america you know we're so ethnocentric we're so focused on us being yeah. the most important thing and not the world around us and we still tend to stigmatize those people you know a tree hugger kind of thing yeah. but you know dr jacobson great conversation i really appreciate your time putting all this into context and it looks like we escaped this time any catastrophe with our weather event but it's so early so far, right? We'll catch that. <laughs> it's raining pretty hard right now, I will tell you. You can see right behind me, there's some raindrops that are falling right there. So, yeah. yeah, no, it's raining pretty hard right at this moment. But, yeah. Well, thank you again so much for having me on your show. And I will uh, hopefully see you again sometime soon. Okay. Thank you. Have a great day. Take care. Thanks.